Hello, so today we're making hydrazine sulfate, which is exciting. Um, now, why, what's the big deal about hydrazine? And, ooh, why, do we, why do we talk about hydrazine? Um, hydrazine is, is useful because it contains a nitrogen-nitrogen single bond. Now, there's heaps of nitrogen in the air. The air is mostly nitrogen, but it's made up of, of dinitrogen, which contains a triple bond between the nitrogens and is very stable. Um, so it's very hard to, to react that with things. So when we have hydrazine, we have a quite reactive nitrogen-nitrogen bond and it allows a lot more nitrogen chemistry to be done. And this is particularly useful in energetics because obviously nitrogen-rich compounds are often very energetic um, because you're reforming that nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond as opposed to the single bond. So, well, the properties of hydrazine are quite similar to ammonia, really, when you, when you think about it. They both form um, very basic solutions in water. You can have the anhydrous hydrazine, you can have an anhydrous ammonia. Um, anhydrous hydrazine is, is very, very toxic and very, very unstable, um, and they use it in um, rocket missions. Um, well, going to space, I think the Curiosity rover had a large amount of hydrazine on it to get it to Mars. Um, so I'm not going to make that, it's, it's, it's a terrible substance. Um, and they both form um, more, much more stable salts. Um, like what we're going to do today, we're going to form hydrazine sulfate. Um, or, now the salts, the salts are better because um, Obviously, you don't have the um, the instability issue um, because because of this nitrogen nitrogen single bond is very reactive. It re reacts quite easily with with oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, so once it's in the salt form, that doesn't happen, and you can just store it. And also, this free hydrazine is, is still very toxic when it's just in a solution in water. Um, so the salt form, it's not volatile, so it's much more harder to be exposed to it. I believe it suppresses your body's ability to process the vitamin B6. I believe that's why it's toxic. Um, probably going to have to look that up. I don't know anything about biochem. But yeah, so how, how are we making this today? Well, first off, we've got a quite annoying reaction to form sodium hypochlorite um, bleach here. Now. We're going to form that through the action of calcium hypochlorite and sodium carbonate. Um, why can't I just use bleach I buy from the store? Well, because we're making much more concentrated bleach here. And also, I have tried with over-the-counter bleach, and it seems to foam so much. I think they add um, things to make it bubble a lot more, and that really just ruins the reaction. I think I got 12 litres of foam last time I ran it. It was, it was dreadful. Um, and then once we have this concentrated bleach, we'll filter this out. We're going to react it with sodium hydroxide and urea to form free hydrazine. And then react this free hydrazine later on with some acids to form the hydrazine sulfate. And get rid of all this. Um, and hydrazine sulfate is relatively insoluble. So it should just crystallize out. And then we leave all the other stuff in solution. So let's go, let's let's make it. So come it. It's nearly all dissolved and I've put a whole lot of more ice in our ice bath. What are we at? We're about a couple of degrees. Um, so the big issue we're fighting today is it's actually a beautiful sunny Australian day, so it's like 35 degrees. Um, so it's really a terrible idea to be out trying to keep things cool on a day like today, but Monty suggested it. So let's go ahead and add our calcium hypochlorite. Of course, um, don't don't wear your best clothes while doing this because I have had a few jumpers, or one jumper ruined by this because you're making very very concentrated bleach. So it's best to um, wear you know a lab coat or clothes you don't really like.
my stow bars got stuck because of all the precipitate here. So I might just chuck another stow bar in there. I don't know if that's a good idea, but. That help? Not really. About three stir bars. Alright, I'm pretty sure that's the maximum amount of stir bars I'm allowed to put in a solution. Any more than that's illegal. Alright, so now it's all precipitated out. It's very, very thick. We get to filter it. Um, so you may have seen my setup already. But here we go. We put our thick liquid into there. We make sure our thing is plugged that back in. And then go under here. We turn. And you can see it's very, very slow, and that'll slow down even more. So this will probably take half an hour. But I'll, I'll skip over this because I'm, I'm sure watching this with the sound is dreadful. While that's filtering, um, we've got to escape the lab a little bit um, and weigh out 95.6 grams of sodium hydroxide. Now, this is annoying because it's quite a lot of sodium hydroxide, and this needs to be dissolved into the sodium hypochlorite, but we can't let the sodium hypochlorite get too hot because it'll um, decompose once again. And the exotherm of sodium hydroxide is quite large, so if I just dump this 95 grams of sodium hydroxide into the hypochlorite solution once it's filtered, the whole thing will boil, we'll just lose all our hypochlorite, and I would have wasted my day not studying with no result. Um, yeah, that's about right. I mean, so, which means we're going to have to add this very slowly in small amounts, which will test my patience. Okay, now we're going to need 68.2 grams of urea, which we will carefully weigh out in here. We now need 68.2 grams of urea, which we will carefully weigh out in here. Mother. Yep. Perfect. Okay, so I've got the urea dissolving in about 60 mils of hot water. Um, even if you add really hot water to it, you're going to have to heat it up to get it all dissolved because the urea, urea dissolving is very endothermic. Um, also, while it's hot, we're going to add a small amount of gelatin. Thanks, Bonte. There. Um, now, this apparently has two purposes. One, it makes the mixture a bit thicker, which apparently helps with the yield. Also, it um, helps scavenge any metal ions and chelate them away, which um, any serious metal ions like iron and stuff helps catalyze the decomposition of hydrazine during the reaction. So, um, having something remove those iron um, and other metals, ions, is useful. Does it really work? I don't really know. Does, I mean, for the sake of you know gelatin, this is this is you know, this cost me nothing really. So I might as well try it and see if I can get you know a few more percentages. later when this is really really thick. But yeah, animal byproducts in the hydrazine production. Who would have thought? Uh, the filtering is nearly done. It's been about 50 minutes, so I'll run it for probably five minutes more. I've got the solution here. You can see it's just got this the very typical bleach colour to it. Um, sometimes some precipitate does make it through, but that's not too huge a problem really if it's a small amount. So this is our filtered product and you can see quite clearly that it is not clear. Um, it's quite cloudy so there's quite a bit of unfiltered uh, out calcium carbonate. Now that's going to end up as calcium sulfate and the hydrogen sulfate. I don't think there's much in there. You don't need much to make it look pretty turbid. Um, 
The good news is, what, what, what I could do is I could re-filter it and get it all out, but I've done an hour of filtering now. I'm pleasantly surprised that my vacuum cleaner hasn't overheated and died in this hot weather and running for an hour. But um, yeah, and I'm quite sick of wearing ear protection, so um, I don't want to re-filter it. And this is this is okay because what we're using this hydrazine sulfate for in the next reaction is reacting it with um, the calcium cyanamide, and the byproduct of that is going to be calcium sulfate anyway. So as long as we don't think that it's going to be a huge amount of calcium carbonate in there, which I don't think it is. Um, I'm just going to proceed as is, and it shouldn't hinder the reaction, it's just going to come, the calcium sulfate is going to come up in our hydrazine sulfate in the end. So I'm still adding the rest of this um, sodium hydroxide slowly to prevent it overheating. Um, about 15 degrees is about where we want a maximum. It's been getting up to 20, which isn't very good, but um, I don't really have all day. Well, I mean, I've been doing this all day, but you know, I don't really have all night. All right, so now we've got our finished hypochlorite here. We've got the urea and gelatin, and we're going to mix them. So this is basically the point you start. If you already have the hydrated sodium hypochlorite, some countries just sell it in the hardware store. This is the point you start, so the three hours or so that I've spent leading up to this point you probably don't need to do, so lucky you. Anyway, um, hydrazine is quite toxic so and unstable to contact with air, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly um, put some glad wrap over the top and that should um, limit the amount of uh, air contact it has and contact I have with hydrazine. Um, it's going to foam a lot. Is my beaker going to contain all the foam? I'm not really sure. Usually I do it a lot less, uh, like um, not as much liquid in here, but I just wanted a lot of hydrazine now. So we could well um, overflow the beaker, but hopefully we don't. Hopefully I can use my new stirrer to keep the foam down a little bit. All right, let's go. Three, two, one. Alrighty. Okay, so it's been over 18 minutes now, and I reckon we're going to take this off the heat. Now, the end point is a little hard to see, but usually it goes from, well, the bleach colour, and then it goes to, a, to an orange, and then it goes to a light yellow. Um, it's harder to see because there's no, because of the turbidity, um, thanks to the calcium carbonate impurities from our homemade bleach, but I reckon that's about done. Hydrazine is, is quite reactive and especially especially while hot obviously so contact with the air will destroy um, this solution of hydrazine here when it's in this free based form. So what we're going to do is we're going to add acids to it once it's cooled. Uh, the acids are first going to react with the carbonate byproducts that we formed, so I think certainly bicarbonate obviously the excess calcium carbonate we've got in there is the impurity and then it will convert the um, free based hydrogen form into a much more stable salt form which should crystallize out and this is the hydrazine sulfate um, to save on costs we're going to do the first bit of the neutralization with hydrochloric um, this, well, this saves on costs and um, sodium chloride has got a much better solubility than sodium sulfate so that should lead to a much better, um, we're just going to crystallize out the hydrazine sulfate, we're not going to have hydrazine sulfate full of sodium sulfate. Okay, here is 240 mils of freezing cold hydrochloric acid. 
it's been in the freezer, it was the first thing I did today. Didn't even have breakfast, just got up, put this acid in the freezer. Um, and then we're going to be neutralizing our hydrazine sulfate. Oh, we're just a hydrazine at the moment. Um, and from memory it bubbles, it foams quite a lot here as well because there's so much carbonate. So I'm going to need a larger container. I don't have a larger beaker than a, than a litre, so improvising here is our two litre container. Um, everything I said about professionalism then now I just, just lost, so just ignore that. Now I haven't actually given credit to the person who I'm method I'm, I'm basically following here, and this is um, off Science Madness once again, and the author is Magpie. Well, I think it Roscoe, Roscoe Bodine, um, however you say the people's username, um, originally did it. Well, wrote up this the synthesis this way through the urea hypochlorite method, and then Magpie made it a bit more accessible, a bit more scaled down, added a few more of his own. Um, tips and then yeah like the like the half um, hydrochloric half sulfuric that's a really good tip alright we'll let that cool down so I've already got a precipitate and I haven't even added the sulfuric acid yet so that's not a good sign but I'm just going to push ahead and add the acid. Oh yes, so my sulfuric acid is black. That's just the dye that adds to the, uh, uh, the acid because it's used in, an, in a drain cleaner or something like that. Yeah, see the bubbles are starting to die down now. Alright, we'll let that cool and see if we get any crystals coming out of it. You can see our, what I'm hoping is our hydrogen sulfate starting to fall out of solution. Um, it's looking about what I expect it uh, to look like from experience. So that's good. Um, it's still very hot, this solution, so we've still got a lot more to precipitate out. Um, it's reasonably insoluble, but Cold. It is does have some degree of solubility, so cooling this down will um, is needed to get it all out. I haven't really seen this before during crystallization, but it appears the it's crystallizing near the surface in some weird ice cube blocks. I suspect this has something to do with the amount of gas that's still being like very slowly put off as uh, got trapped inside the crystals as they formed and made the lump start floating and then um, the other crystals have collected around it but still if I move this probably yeah that's where I thought this is the day after so it's been in the fridge overnight you see we've got a good crop of crystals in there then filter wash with a little ice cold water and dry thoroughly on the pump. So to dry these crystals off, I put them in an oven for a little while and then left to dry overnight. Like I took them out of the oven to dry overnight, otherwise I melt the plastic. Um, that seems like a bit of a bad choice because the oven has made everything else re-dissolve in, in a small amount of liquid that was remaining and now it's sort of set into this big block of crystals but yeah all right so I crushed up the hydrazine a bit more and then dried it completely so now it's fu fully dry and we've got a yield of 74.9 grams which is pretty good um, I think the yields get better percentage wise as you scale it up it has something to do with its uh, you know being able to generate that heat to sustain itself for a little while longer. Um, it's, this is probably horribly impure, it's pretty crude I think, given the fact it's not even completely white, I think it's still got some of the colorant from the sulfuric acid in it that wasn't washed out very well. But it is definitely appropriate for our purposes. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I'll see you next time when we get to rack this with our cyanamide, use uh, minoguanidine bicarbonate.